Hello, everyone, and welcome to our social dilemma, Confronting Online Harms in Canada. I'm Sam Andrew. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the Ryerson Leadership Lab, and we're thrilled you're able to join us today. Today's event is co-hosted by Ryerson University Cybersecure Policy Exchange, a, pol a project of the Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst and the Ryerson Leadership Lab, as well as McGill University Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy. Before we begin, I'd like to give a land acknowledgement today, reflective of where I am in Toronto. We do this as a symbolic restorative act, one among many to follow and part of a wider, hopefully transformative reconciliation project here at our university that in its is itself in a renaming process to reconcile the legacy of our namesake for a more inclusive future. Toronto is on the territory of Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat. It's covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, Treaty 13, and the Williams Treaties. We're, committing to, we're committed to honoring our obligations to these nations, treaties, and to justice for Indigenous peoples. Through our work here at the Cybersecure Policy Exchange, we hope to do that by amplifying Indigenous voices and ensuring we're making space to consider the unique realities uh, and digital divides faced by Indigenous peoples in Canada. So social media is where more and more Canadians are connecting with their family and friends and engaging in civic discourse. And at the same time, the spread of illegal and harmful uh, content through these platforms can pose significant risks to uh, our social cohesion, our public safety, our democracy. Uh, things like hate speech targeting marginalized groups, uh, disinformation enabling extremism or conspiracy theories. Uh, the unique speed and reach of these platforms have led to calls for unique regulatory solutions to tackle the challenge. Uh, while at the same time, legitimate concerns have been raised about over-censorship and our fundamental freedoms and rights being at risk. In July, the Government of Canada released a proposed new legislative framework that would govern content moderation online for five specific types of illegal content hate speech, child sexual exploitation, terrorist content, content that incites violence, and non-consensual sharing of intimate images. The newly re-elected government is going to be short, sworn in shortly, and the purpose of today's discussion is to dig into that proposal, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, we at the Cybersecure Policy Exchange released a new report on, on this topic that provides our recommendations for how to uh, improve the government's proposal and also includes the results of three national surveys we've done with Canadians over the last three years on these complex topics. Um, we believe the results of surveys like these, while imperfect, are still important tools as we really know very little about these platforms due to a lack of meaningful transparency. And also there's an inherent tension in balancing uh, different harms that arise from regulating something like speech online. Um, and so we, we wanted to briefly go over uh, those, um, some of those findings today and you can uh, read more uh, in the link that we're putting in the chat. Um, but, um, in the meantime, um, so as I said, we've done three uh, anonymous surveys uh, with random samples of, of Canadians over the past uh, three years, and you can uh, dig into some of the more details um, uh, in the report. Um, but just to kind of guide the conversation as a guideline, a sample of this size would be accurate, plus or minus about two percentage points, 19 times out of 20. So who's using these platforms? Uh, quite a few people uh, in Canada. So uh, you can see here on the screen, uh, fully 91% of Canadians tell us they're using YouTube, 75% Facebook, <clears throat> majorities using Pinterest and Instagram, um, and many people using it at least every day. Uh, likewise, messaging apps like Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp and Instagram um, are used by large proportions of Canadians. We also know that they're reporting uh, relatively frequent exposure to online harms. So this is the proportion of uh, Canadians who uh, report seeing at least weekly violent content, um, hate speech, and deliberately false information. And you can see um, uh, majorities of the people who say they're regularly uh, using Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter uh, say they're seeing that at least once a week. Um, uh, sorry, a majority of Canadians uh, uh, say they're um, seeing that at least once a week. Um, we also know that racialized Canadians uh, are reporting more online harms uh, more frequently. Uh, so uh, they're significantly more likely to report seeing racist content online, hate speech, or to um, report or flag an account uh, for being hateful. Um, we also know, and this is always the first question we ask in all these surveys, is um, do you believe these various companies um, uh, act in the public's best interest? Do you have trust in these companies to act in the public's best interest? Um, and unprompted, 
the big uh, social media companies are always in last place. Uh, so you can see here, uh, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram are at the bottom in terms of proportion of Canadians who trust them to act in the public's best interest. And there's still quite strong um, trust in Canadian news media, which I think is a, is a good sign. Um, but it's that lack of trust that I think uh, has in some ways uh, fueled the calls for more regulatory action. Um, we asked Canadians, to, they had to choose between two statements, and these are obviously, you know, a, a false dichotomy, but I think it's always instructive. Um, so we asked people to choose between reducing the amount of hate speech, harassment, and false information online is more important than free expression, or protecting freedom of expression is more important. You could see 70% of Canadians said reducing um, uh, online harm is more important. And that proportion is actually up from when we asked in 2019, it was 61%. Um, we also asked on the bottom slide, um, should government intervene in social media companies to require them to fix the problems they've created versus not? Um, and again, about 70% balance toward intervention. When we ask about specific forms of intervention, um, you can see that on the bottom, the most popular is to require platforms to delete accounts that impersonate others. 55% strongly support that, 23% uh, support it. And you can see in the yellow, the ones that uh, don't support um, really uh, never get above 10%, that these are kind of widely uh, supported proposals, things like requiring platforms to delete illegal content in a timely manner, which we're going to discuss in detail today, um, things like requiring automated content or bot accounts to be banned. So when you probe Canadians on the specific ideas, most uh, think this is a good idea. But uh, as we're going to talk about today, the devil is really in the details. There's you know, huge risks in, in over censorship. And um, we hope to dig into that today. So um, we are now going to move to uh, introducing our panelists who are going to help us uh, dig into this uh, complex challenge. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased uh, to uh, to do so. And we also welcome and encourage your participation in this discussion. You can use the chat function. We ask you, of course, to use it respectfully, uh, but um, we encourage your, your comments, uh, reflections, and questions. And uh, Taylor, our moderator, is going to do the best to bring in those questions to our panelists. Um, and I also want to give a big thank you to our panelists for joining us and graciously offering their time. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce first uh, Amira. She's the Director of Programming and Outreach at the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. As a journalist and human rights advocate, Amira has worked in Canada's labor movement and spent five years promoting the civil liberties of Canadian Muslims at the National Council of Canadian Muslims. She, uh, she's supported several national in initiatives to counter hate and promote inclusion, including as the founding board member of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network and past board member at the Silk Road Institute. Thanks for being here, Amira. Uh, Emily Thanks, Laidlaw. Emma. Sorry. Uh, Emily Laidlaw is a Canada Research Chair in Cybersecurity Law and Associate Professor at the University of Calgary. Her research focuses on information technology regulation and human rights, with an emphasis on content regulation, privacy, and freedom of expression. Emily is also the author of Regulating Speech in Cyberspace, Gatekeepers, Human Rights, and Corporate Responsibility, and is an active contributor to law reform and other advisory work with the federal government, the Law Commission of Ontario, and the OECD. Thanks for being here. Uh, originally from Canada, Reagan McDonald lives now in Brussels, where she leads Mozilla Corporation's global uh, public policy team. Reagan has also worked at Access Now, an organization defending the rights of users at risk around the world, and at European Digital Rights, an association of civil and research organizations working to defend and advance digital rights across Europe and beyond. She's also a board member of the Digital Freedom Fund, a nonprofit supporting strategic litigation to advance digital rights in Europe. Thanks for being here, Reagan. And finally, our moderator for today's discussion is Taylor Owen. Taylor is the Beaverbrook Chair in Media Ethics and Communications and is the founding director of the Center for Media Technology and Democracy and an associate professor at the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill University. He's also the host of the Big Tech Podcast, a senior fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation, a fellow at the Public Policy Forum, and sits on the Governing Council of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Thank you all for being here, and I'm gonna pass it down to Taylor. Thanks so much, Sam. And uh, I'm really thrilled uh, to be here with everybody, um, both our amazing panel and uh, and what's looking like a great audience of people who are, I know, following this topic closely and deeply invested in it, um, as I think we all should be, because um, these are sort of big, important policy debates we're in the middle of right now. And, and I just want to stress that, that we really are still in the middle of it. Um, 
Sam mentioned ongoing legislative processes in Canada, and it's worth flagging that there are three that are still unfinished. <laughs> we have a, a C-11, a Privacy Act reform that is still um, in development, um, C-10, looking at our broadcast policy, and of course, what we're here to talk about primarily here, um, C-36, which is a piece of online harms legislation. And so I would suggest that Canada, like many other countries in the world right now, are really in the midst of this really complicated um, and multifaceted policy debate. And the, the consequence of this consultation, I think, on the online harms legislation and the fact we've had an election, um, perhaps timed coincidentally around the same time as the consultation, um, is that we have a bit of a pause and a chance for a reset on this piece of legislation at the moment. And so I'm looking forward to talking about that. And I, I'm, I'm very excited we get to do it with these three panelists whose work I deeply admire and follow closely on this topic. And I think, um, I think we'll all learn a lot um, from diving into how we got to this position around this legislation and maybe where the Canadian government um, should go when it returns um, in looks like a little over a month from now in November. Um, so, so we wanted to start just with a, a quick round of everybody um, giving a few opening comments um, about where they're coming at this topic from and sort of some broad thoughts on directionally where we're going here. Um, and, then we're, and then we're gonna dive into some of the details. Um, so uh, Amira, I'd, I'd like to welcome you to go first. Sure, thanks so much, Taylor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me participating in today's panel. Um, I'm speaking to you from Ottawa uh, on the unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. I wanna congratulate Cybersecure Policy Exchange for their important new report, Rebuilding Canada's Public Square, um, and for having this discussion. Um, so the consensus is pretty clear. Ottawa, we have a problem, a major problem when it comes to online hate. But how we address this problem really, as many of us know, is not so clear cut. Um, I'm someone who has had the privilege of having a bit of a front row seat to both communities that are directly impacted by the prolifer proliferation of hate, as well as among circles where relevant policy and research are discussed from sort of a 1000 foot view. And I can confidently say that all of us are sharing common concerns, yet the urgency differs because for some of us, the issue of online hate in particular is a matter of life and death. Um, as we all know, six men were senselessly shot in cold blood in the worst attack on a place of worship on Canadian soil by a killer who was so consumed by hatred that he took their lives and would have taken the lives of many more if he could have, simply because they were Muslim. And we know that he had been influenced by online hate. In fact, in the case, R versus Bissonnette, uh, Justice Francois Huo indicated at various paragraphs uh, that of the decision that Bissonnette drew upon online sources before committing this horrific attack. And just a few months ago, the Afzal family was taking an evening stroll when a killer struck them with his truck, killing the parents, a grandmother, a sister, and leaving a little boy behind who is now living with his uncle and using a wheelchair. We do not know for sure in that case if the perpetrator in that attack was motivated by online hate, yet our communities are very well aware of the dangers and the environment and the ecosystem of hate that exists that many of us believe that certainly there's likely some influence there. Furthermore, we know that this phenomenon is impacting a variety of communities and racialized communities in this country. For instance, the Canadian Chinese National Council for Social Justice, in collaboration with Professor Ishtiak Ahmed of the University of Toronto, has collected over 3,000 anti-Chinese tweets that contain stigmatizing themes or messages, and many of them are still available on Twitter. And as the Canadian Anti-Hate Network has noted, we are experiencing the highest number ever of police reported hate crimes in this country. One in five Canadians have reported being the victim of online hate. One in two members of the 2SLGBTQ plus community report the same. 
At the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, we teamed up with YWCA on a campaign titled Block Hate, one of many campaigns that are currently being undertaken by a variety of community organizations to raise awareness and empower communities who are desperate for action in what feels a little bit like a vacuum right now. The latest polling presented today by Cybersecure Policy Exchange are reflective of the results of CRF's own polling released a few months ago that also illustrated the extent of the problem and that a majority of Canadians expect action by the government. So some of those numbers, and they're available on our website, you know, 78% of Canadians are concerned about the spread of hate speech, 74% are concerned about the rise of right-wing extremism and terrorism, and 72% about the growing political polarization, and again, 60% who believe that there needs to be more done. So clearly there is, again, consensus around addressing this. And the impact specifically on racialized connection, uh, Canadians are that they are three times more likely to have experienced this kind of behavior online. Um, and younger Canadians are far more likely to have experienced or faced hateful comments or content online. And all of this is also silencing and marginalizing women, BIPOC, um, 2LGBTQ plus persons and other equity deserving groups. They either forget about participating in the public square altogether, they are discouraged from entering politics, from sharing opinion. We've seen attacks on journalists in recent weeks. Um, and so what's happening is really that silencing um, and that limiting of freedom of expression. So the solutions, as we're going to explore today, are complex and multifaceted. The recommendations from community organizations range from recommending many of the ideas that are currently presented in the government's technical paper to more granular recommendations like even prescribing the number of clicks it should take across platforms to be able to report hate. Um, and as the new report released today is showing, what is becoming clear is that um, this is a real threat to Canada's social cohesion, public safety, and democracy, um, and is certainly one of uh, the key priorities that all of us should be undertaking right now. Thank you. Thank you, Mira. Um, Regan, would you like to go next? Thanks, Taylor. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, uh, I have a couple comments that I would like to get into that talk a little bit about the government white paper. Um, but first, a lot of the findings that Sam presented in the report resonate with a lot of what we see in Europe. I am uh, Canadian myself, uh, but I have been living in Europe for over 13 years. So my a lot of my experience uh, has been based in Europe uh, and comparative regulation in the EU and a lot of the work around platform accountability that me and my team does at Mozilla is based in many different parts of the world. So I would like to comment on the white paper and our learnings from these different uh, legislations that we're seeing, such as the Digital Services Act that has been proposed in the EU. So to be frank, we were a little bit disappointed with the government white paper that was put forward. And this is essentially because the government approach is really underpinned by this idea that platforms can sanitize the web or that the web can be sanitized. And that really gets at the symptoms and not necessarily the structural causes of online harm. Um, in reality, harmful content is really more harmful or can, re can it, it can be more harmful in the way that it's amplified or specifically targeted at people through content recommendation systems or micro-targeting. So that's why at Mozilla, we think that governments should take a systems level approach to addressing online harm and illegal content online. And therefore to make sure that platforms and large platforms in particular have more, count, more accountability and, and behave more responsibly. And that's really to ensure that their business practices don't ignore or in the worst case, amplify harm. And so as a starting point, I have a handful of recommendations that I'd like to go through that help sort of articulate what I mean by a systems level approach. So first is to have a, an asymmetrical approach. So there isn't really a one size fits all, like one regulation or one sort of silver bullet that will fix all of online harm. And you also want to be very careful not to unnecessarily burden small or low risk 
companies. So looking at legislation in this area should really focus on scale and risk. And it's essentially what I often call the Peter Parker principle, that the more responsibility, or the, the greater the platform, the more responsibility it should have. Um, the second point is to take a risk-based approach. So this would require companies to internally assess risk inside of their um, companies and to perform audits, also to allow for third-party auditing. And this is the way for them to identify the ways in which the design and the operation and potential misuse could compound or accelerate online harm. And then the company should be obliged to take steps to mitigate these harms in what would become essentially a virtuous cycle, which would encourage more accountability. And I wanna add that this shouldn't be a sort of tick box exercise. And from what we've seen from the Facebook files of um, you know, the whistleblower, we have seen that many companies uh, do extensively audit all aspects of their uh, platforms and different aspects of harm. It's just not available to oversight bodies or to public researchers or to the general public. The third point I want to make that's very important, speaking of transparency, is systemic transparency. Some of the most egregious harms are hidden from site. And this is a real pre, like, crucial prerequisite for more accountability in this space. So what we would recommend is a robust transparency framework that includes things like disclosure of advertising, more transparency on content curation and, on, and other aspects. And my final, uh, my final recommendation is uh, to have polycentric oversight. Polycentric oversight is quite a, a, a wonky term, but what I essentially mean is that we would want to avoid um, uh, enforcement bottlenecks. So the, the Canadian government has proposed a new regulator, which is great, um, but in order for them to be efficient and to, to, to do the job that they're intended to do, they're sort of the three necessary aspects that, are, that will be needed. Resources, independence, uh, which means that they will need sort of political buy-in at the very highest levels, especially if they're dealing with some of the very most powerful companies in the world, um, and expertise to be able to assess um, compliance and to support uh, an oversight framework. And then to the point of having a sort of decentralized framework to remove bottlenecks so all enforcement wouldn't fall on one or some uh, new regulators, that's where the transparency element comes into play and the third party audit. Um, so it's not just a company that you have to trust is saying what they say and an oversight body that doesn't really have the evidence to truly regulate and understand the harm. Um, well, to first to understand it and then to, to, to craft effective solutions in order to address the problem. So, um, so that approach for us with these four elements is really what, um, these are the sort of features that compose an effective accountability framework. You might recognize a lot of them. They are in the, uh, a lot of the proposed uh, um, things that I just talked about are in the DSA uh, and Mozilla and many other actors have long been advocating for this. And so we were glad to see our recommendations here and in other parts around the world. Um, so I will uh, stop there because I'm very keen to hear from Emily and to get into the discussion. So thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Emily, floor is yours. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, so much to talk about. I'm looking forward to it. So I'm actually uh, going to kind of feed off this with a bit of a regulatory discussion and um, very high level that, you know, regulating online harms, it almost goes without saying it's, it's complicated. And I think the issue is, is that there's really no way to simplify it. And so I, I'm glad we have a proposal on the table because we actually have something now to, to work with. Um, but uh, I, I do think that it needs to be quite significantly revamped because at the moment, I don't see it as being human rights compliant. Um, and I don't think it's going to go as far as it needs to, or and sometimes in some cases backfire in achieving the objective of reducing harm to very groups that it's actually seeking to protect. I am conscious we need this regulation and we need it now. You know, Amira, you know, phrases that um, ecosystem of hate. Uh, but I don't think that there are any shortcuts to us getting there. 
So why is this kind of regulation hard to design? Um, you know, it's you end up finally ba balancing all these things, business innovation and promotion of competition on one end, protection of human rights, in particular freedom of expression, privacy and equality. And I'd include within that protection from harm but also freedom of the business to, to develop its business as it sees fit, but also then be accountable for the public impact of those decisions. So, you know, the business model issue that we often face in these discussions, but also any legal framework has to be one that promotes access to justice. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing this kind of global push for creation of regulatory agencies. But on the ground, this means that every little decision matters. So I will state up front that I do think that the idea of creation of a regulator, theoretically, is a really good idea. We just need more detail as to what they're looking to do, and it needs to be more carefully crafted than what it is at the moment, because otherwise it could backfire. Um, at the moment, the proposal is skewed towards content removal as the avenue to protect individuals and groups from harm, and it is certainly an important tool to do that, but it does take a blunt approach, and it assumes that content removal in all forms will somehow fix the problem. So I think this is something we're really going to get into in our discussion, so I won't dwell on it here, but let me just give just a short example so that we know why these blunt, you know, approaches might backfire. You know, the 24 hour content takedown rule, it's easier for something like child sexual abuse images, not great for anything that requires a contextual analysis like, say, hate propaganda. Um, and we know that these kinds of complaint systems can be abused and often the content takedown is that of marginalized, racialized and intersectional groups. Um, same with, uh, you know, issues we're seeing with, you know, the risks of, of proactive monitoring. I would say that that should be categorically rejected as in what is being proposed. Um, but we're seeing too with the way the proposal works that in combination, the idea that platforms might have to report to law enforcement these kind of suspicions of illegality, this creates this combination where there would be this general surveillance of internet users combined then with needing to report suspicious activity. So this takes groups that are already over-policed and makes them more vulnerable. Um, it doesn't protect them, it actually is driving them away from the spaces. So these are the details that need to be reworked in this proposal. And, and I kind of want to leave with one final thought about freedom of expression where I've done quite a bit of work. Um, I think that, you know, when I think about this proposal, one of the major problems with it is that it does pay minimal attention to freedom of expression. Um, and, and part of that, I would say, is that we need a better articulation of what freedom of expression means in Canada. So freedom of expression needs to be inclusive of all. We need to pay attention to the groups that bear the burden of freedom of expression and those that benefit from it. But the law protects, um, you know, the right to offend. Uh, it protects humiliating speech. But how to balance that in social media spaces where groups kind of form and breed hate? Comments might be off the cuff and poorly formed. And I always think of mob pylons. You know, what comes to mind to me is always the Gamergate scenario. These are the, the complexities that we're dealing with. And the proposal as it stands kind of sidesteps some of these harder questions. And I think it needs to be deal, dealt with more directly so that it achieves the balancing of rights that's necessary here for these type of platform and, and, and social media regulation. Thank you. Um, and thanks to the three of you. I mean, I think that set the bounds of our conversation in a way we could go in a million different directions. Um, but I, I, I want to start with sort of the first principle of the need for this sort of some sort of regulatory regime here that is new um, and bespoke to a set of online harms. Um, this, this legislation, C36, is often sort of called the online harm legislation, um, but it actually isn't about online harms, which is a much broader concept. It's actually about already illegal speech. And, and that's a narrowing that the government chose to do at some point, to, rather than doing more of sort of a duty of care type model in the UK, they said, okay, we're gonna start with, at least my reading of it is to start with 
all five categories of things that are already illegal. Which begs the question to me, if they are already illegal, why do we need something new? And either, it seems to me, they change in magnitude due to the nature of our online communications, or they change in kind. They are, they are different, fundamentally. And, and I'd like to get your, all of your thoughts on that. Like, what is it about the nature of the online ecosystem that makes our existing regulatory and legal mechanisms inadequate for this problem? Or, 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 or is, that, is that a false premise? Is it, are, do we, is it just a matter of enforcing laws we already have? Um, so do you want to jump in? I'm open to anybody to jump in there. But Emily, yeah. Maybe I'll just set us off with this discussion because this right. is, you know, other work I did was in the area of, of defamation for a while. And I always talk about that as this high volume, low value, le legally complex matrix. And, and it's because we might have these laws on the book, but it doesn't mean that you actually have access to justice or access to an avenue to be able to resolve that particular dispute. And so mm. why I saw... Um, or I see this type of regulation as necessary is that, you know, we might have hate speech provisions in the criminal code, um, but if we talk to particular groups, the everyday ways that they are being impacted and harmed is not being effectively dealt with or regulated. And so what we need is this broadly, this, this idea of a regulatory regime. And, you know, you, you had asked kind of as part of this is, is this something new? Is this something different? And I think you know, the, the, the basic harms we're talking about aren't different, um, but it is, it's kind of the way that they're amplified, the extent of it, the attack vectors, all of that is different and far more complex and difficult to be able to control. Regan, is that, is that what you yeah, would... talked about? We talk about like the systemic structural elements of this? Yeah, uh, exactly. I think that's that's I think there's one piece around whether or not like the rights may be there and the legal content is illegal. But I think it's clear that given the changes in technology and the way that specific harm can um, be amplified, be spread, the virality of how certain misleading, divisive, divisive and hateful content can spread um, and be targeted so precisely to specific people that will be so vulnerable to that particular message is really what has sort of changed the game for harm and for online harm. And I think that's exactly why we need a modern regulatory approach to address that. Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to, I was just going to bring it back to, you know, a real life example. Um, for instance, we have just, you know, just this past week, um, you know, uh, an individual, many, many who follow online hate know this man, Kevin J. Johnson, who had been, um, you know, he, you know, he's a right wing social media personality. Um, he was promoting hate against specifically uh, an individual named Hamid Faki, who, uh, you know, is a multimillionaire and who was able to go after him for defamation, simply because being able to go after him for hate speech and the hate that he was promoting against him was not really much of an option. Um, that there was no enforcement. Uh, there was almost, you know, and I've actually seen this firsthand where police services almost, you know, throw up their hands and say, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to go after these people. And of course, deplatforming works. Um, but what we see is that they, that individuals like this keep popping up, that there's no uh, long-term consequences to this uh, repeat behavior, for instance. And so it takes someone who has, you know, the wherewithal, and Emily talked about access to justice, someone who has the wherewithal, who's, who has the privilege to be able to go after an, an individual like this over the course of several years to finally get a judge to put him behind bars for the, the hate that he's promoting and actually enforce that type of, of uh, legislation that already exists. So mm -hmm. it, it speaks to a system that is broken, um, that is unable to sort of meet the current challenges. And for lay people like us who are not scholars, who are not researchers, we really are at a loss to know how do we protect ourselves from individuals who, as um, has been pointed out by Regan and Emily, are indeed fomenting uh, hate that has 
Shield World Conference, and what really it seems that um, we're not seeing enough action on from those who are supposedly protecting us. But that being said, and we'll talk later, uh, the real concern, though, with the government's approach right now is that on the flip side, we may see the over surveillance of some of these very uh, these marginalized communities as well. And that in and of itself is something to be very concerned with too. So it's it's almost a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario that really has to be balanced very carefully. Thank you, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so let's turn a bit to what was proposed or what is currently um, um, has been um, put in in the white paper and his the request has been put out and closed now on consultation. Um, and I, it seems to me that a core feature, and there's lots of details spelled out there, but a core feature of the government's chosen approach is um, a, take, a 24 hour takedown regime um, aligned with broadly speaking, the German approach. Um, and if we look at sort of the international comparisons here, there was clearly a choice made to go that direction rather than more sort of a British studio care type model. Um, and I wonder if, and I, I think it's worth pausing on that because it seems to me that's a, a real strategic choice here. And it's one that we know something about because we have an, we have an example in the German case. And I wonder if Reagan, you could just provide a few comments on what we know about what's worked and not worked um, in that case, how platforms reacted um, and what sort of the, the, the consensus is in the EU right now of how that model has played out. So, so that approach, which I call often the whack-a-mole approach. So it's like this idea of trying to get platforms to just take down more content more quickly um, assuming that will kind of fix the problem of harmful content, mm -hmm. was the kind of dominant approach in Europe. Germany mentioned the Nets DG, but in, in Europe, there was the, the terrorist content regulation, which is still in negotiations, which also mandates a 24 hour takedown, which essentially, I mean, a 24 hour takedown, even for the largest companies, essentially means they will put a filter on it and have an algorithm deal with it because they don't want to deal with that legal liability. Um, this also came up a lot in the disinformation uh, dialogues. And essentially, I guess the example I can give of why this is an inadequate approach um, is that, you know, you could ask a platform, a major platform, and this, this happened in the code of practice of disinformation is this sort of um, self-regulatory dialogue that the commission convened. Mozilla is one of the founding uh, signatories. And essentially what a company, you know, a major tech company would say, uh, I won't say names, would say, we disabled uh, 2 million accounts this month ahead of the European elections. And what does that tell you exactly when you don't have transparency or an understanding into what is the scale of, of, of the problem of fake accounts? Are those fake accounts creating hateful content and spreading it to people? Is that therefore resulting in offline harm? How, how do you understand the whole ecosystem of where the harm is originating? And we're only focusing on the very tip of it that we deleted this many um, accounts. So you don't know if, it's, if they're doing a great job or if the platform has a, has a super huge problem <laughs> with fake accounts or if fake accounts is even a problem. So it really just doesn't tell the whole story you don't understand the scope of the problem and it and you can't really measure accountability. So it's actually not really in the best interest of the company themselves because they can't demonstrate that they are really doing in their best effort to mitigate harm and to, and to stop harm at the, at the core. So that's why we keep advocating for the more systems level to go to the recommendations, to get more transparency, have more disclosure. Thank you. Um, Emily, I mean, Emily, first, I guess maybe, from a, the perspective of free expression here, it seems pretty clear that one of the reaction, one of the consequences of these mandated takedowns has been over censoring and over filtering, um, particularly when paired with the scale of fine that they were scaled, they were paired with, um, at least in the NetSDG case. Um, it, can you talk through how you think, see the, the potential consequences, particularly on free expression of these kinds of takedown regimes? Yeah, and I, you know, 
I mean, the kind of 24 hour content takedown rule that that uh, NetsDG introduced it, you know, it, it's what Reagan had noted that it does incentivize content removal without assessment of context. And that's problematic from a free expression um, perspective, because there's all kinds of speech at the margins that um, that requires that human analysis that's deeply contextual to be able to understand whether this is actually content that's highlighting atrocities, that's kind of a group speaking, kind of an in-group commentary that is about social justice and social movements. And, and, or is this an instance where it's kind of fomenting hate, which is also in that weird gray area, which is really difficult mm -hmm. for that analysis. Mm -hmm. None of that kind of contextual analysis is gonna exist when you prompt that kind of content takedown. But we do have a problem. And I think one of the, the, the flip sides in saying there's a free expression concern is, you know, I, you're deeply aware that the, the answer isn't to say, well, we should just err on the side of free expression and therefore not do anything about this because mm. there are tremendous harms that are associated with this kind of content. And so it's how do we deal with that need for expertise, the need for human moderation, given the scale of the content that, that we're dealing with. And yeah. Reagan has talked about this kind of systems level approach and that that needs to be developed and built into this regulatory system. That's really what the only way that we can do that. Um, I, I know there's been a lot of criticism of the UK approach, this duty of care model. Um, I, I, you know, there's good and bad about it, but there is something quite interesting about the idea of a duty of care. It is familiar in law. We mm. understand what that is, and it covers a lot of ground. The, the weakness mm. of it is that it can impact negatively small and medium sized companies in particular, because why? The rules are uncertain, right? We have to wait for a while to develop what that looks like. And if we care about innovation, then um, then that can create a problematic environment. So there's so much we could say about that. I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do wonder if Amir wants to pick up on that. I mean, Amir, you were part of the Commission on Democratic Expression last year um, that explicitly recommended both against a 24-hour takedown regime and for a statutory responsibility analogous broadly to the duty of care as an alternative model. Um, so I wonder if you want to speak to that tra the trade-offs you see between the two and, and maybe pick up a little bit too on the, the final comment you made there, which was this: the, another core aspect of this legislation is the data sharing, is man, new forms of data sharing between plat, mandatory data sharing platforms and, and policing services in Canada and public safety um, organizations in Canada. Can you talk a little bit about your concerns around that aspect of it too? Because I think those are really important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Thank no, you. so... For sure. So the Canadian Commission on Democratic Expression, uh, convened by the Public Policy Forum, you know, we spent you know close to eight months sort of studying this last year, um, and indeed came up with sort of six steps of uh, of a program to reduce online hate. And indeed, one of the number one recommendations was around the duty of care, um, and against the the twenty four hour takedown. Which I should say, um, you know, community groups and organizations are critical of this because they do see the need to take down content rapidly especially if it poses a danger and certainly uh, there are worries that you know um, if if there is a dangerous content that is available um, and it's not taken down quickly you know it is in that in the earliest manifestation of that content that you have the most potential uh, possibility of harm so it was a it was a careful balancing, but indeed there was still within those recommendations um, a need to ensure um, that there was a way to quickly remove content that presented an imminent threat to a person. So um, if there was an imminent threat, again, the issues are complex in the sense of who determines this. And we don't have, again, it's been raised by Regan and Emily, a lot of the transparency that is still required. And in fact, uh, you know, the second year uh, uh, that we are now looking, um, the commission is now looking at the issues um, is indeed to try to understand 
um, what are we going to do around the transparency um, that these online platforms are providing, which at the moment is, is not great to, to, to put it mildly. Um, and so that's going to be a really important thing to think about um, is how we ensure uh, that we, you know, that we actually have access, that researchers, that journalists have access to understanding how these decisions are made when it comes to moderation. Now, when it comes to uh, some of the critiques around the current um, suggested uh, way of addressing this by the government in their paper, um, various uh, community organizations, including, for instance, I'll quote from the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group, as well as others, have pointed out out that there are some really concerning um, expansions of definitions here, for instance, of terrorism um, within this uh, sort of this regime that really can create, um, and, and Emily had alluded to it earlier, the over surveillance of the very communities that we are trying purportedly to protect. Um, and so, you know, it's been actually described as a, uh, almost a, a digital C-51. And for those uh, in civil liberties uh, groups know that C-51 was deeply problematic uh, in terms of its unconstitutional attack on civil liberties and the way that it could erode um, freedoms. And so the same concerns are now being raised with this uh, proposal um, and, and also uh, the new you know, suggested reporting rules to law enforcement and intelligence agencies, which someone described to me as potentially the largest digital carding experiment ever. Uh, and that is deeply alarming for uh, communities that uh, you know, have been over-policed and over surveilled. So uh, there is, as Emily said, and Taylor has uh, also said, you know, we're in the middle of this discussion. It's, we're not at the end of it by, by any stretch of the imagination. Thank you. And, and I want to turn to sort of where we, where we can go now, um, given that we are sort of in the middle of it. Um, I, I guess to kick that conversation off, um, give, even if the specifics of some of this legislation require shifting in direction or, or a fundamental change. Um, there is a governance architecture that was proposed, I would argue, in this legislation. And it's worth sort of reminding ourselves, I think, what that was. And, and I'd like to get your, your, each of your senses of, is that the right structure? Um, before we talk about what that structure should be empowered to do. So there's a new regulator, as was mentioned, a safety digital say online safety commissioner um, who would have a new office and authority. There is a recourse council, which in other countries has been called an e-tribunal. Um, I think maybe is something more like a domestic Facebook oversight board <laughs> type thing. Um, and there's an advisory board, which in other contexts is often called a social media council. A sort of, stakeholders who will give input into the regulator. Now, it seems to me saying those three things doesn't necessarily determine what they will do, what they will be empowered to do, but do you think we're in the right structural territory here, or does that also need to be revisited? Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe we're gonna let, we're gonna start with you, and if we take your sort of more system, systemic approach, could that structure enforce that model? Or do we need to rethink that from the ground up as well? I think it's hard to say like what would work without the right like first step. So it, it's it's hard, it's hard to, to judge because looking at the paper, you know, what the, the safety commissioners would be empowered to do is not what we would envision as in, you know, they would essentially be content moderators, which is not compliant with a free yeah. expression, you know, bill of rights society. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, it, it seems the idea of having a regulator, I think is, is, you know, many governments are moving in this way. It seems like it's about time because most technology issues are kind of ad hoc regulators at a telco regulators, mm -hmm. media regulator. So I think it's probably time to have some sort of technology regulator, right. maybe starting with online harms and building up from there. So I think that is a really sound idea, but regulating bodies, they take many, many years to formulate. So that's sort of like a long-term vision. Um, in terms of the advisory board, I wasn't very clear on that. I think it's important to consult yeah. with, um, say with the companies that are impacted, especially because as I mentioned, there's no sort of one size fits all regulation. These responsibilities would have to be tailor-made 
and implemented specifically for different services, different platforms. And so that's where I could imagine some kind of dialogue happening, but mm -hmm. I would also uh, be cautious of it not uh, veering into a capture type of territory where those <laughs> impacted platforms would have a little too much access to the regulators. Um, so I guess those would be my two sort of points. Emily or Amira, do you want to jump in on that one? I'll jump in. Uh, so I am, I, I would say the same thing as Regan that we need, we do need some more detail. Um, and I think, um, broadly speaking, I, I'm very supportive of the idea of a regulator. It's something I've been advocating for, for a while. And it's mainly because of um, just the unrealistic prospect that a court is well placed to deal with um, all these disputes. And what ends up happening is that they just, you know, they're, they're not being prosecuted um, for a variety of reasons. And, and it's still available that, that route, but we need some other way on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to deal with these disputes. And one of the, you know, things we haven't really um, explored, which, which Amira touched on briefly was, you know, you're looking at these private bodies that are essentially regulating the, the, the public square of the modern age. And what is the appropriateness of these private bodies doing this? We need them to do it. We need them to develop their own policies. There is, you know, they have um, access to, to data and to knowledge of how their platforms work to come up with some really innovative solutions. But in the end, we're talking about illegal speech that um, properly needs a state-based oversight body. So what is being proposed? Um, I like that it is more broadly focused than just being a tribunal, um, that it has a research and education arm. It has that mm -hmm. kind of privacy commissioner feel. It's certainly a leap of faith, I think, to say, I hope it's properly resourced. And we all know that's a constant issue. Um, I hope it has the right people. As you know, Reagan mm. said, it's not captured mm. by industry. Um, so all of that we need to safeguard against. Um, I, I worry about, you know, and there's something actually in this, this report that, you know, uh, Sam authored, it, it uh, notes it's unbalanced at the moment of who could kind of appeal complaints. Those who uh, were content has been left up could appeal, but not those whose content has been removed. So this mm -hmm. needs to be more fulsome. I actually think that we need to find a way to disincentivize complaints as well. Otherwise it will be overrun. Um, so, uh, and, and I, um, I don't want to overtake this at all, but I, I, I let me let end with one final point about the idea of the regulator. First, I don't know how they're going to integrate this advisory body. Can you imagine a world where the advisors are identifying all these key issues are, you know, what is their relationship with the, the, the recourse council or the commission, um, to mm. be able to influence them besides just ending up in a corner raising their hand and saying i'm really concerned right mm -hmm. um so uh and the last one would be how does this all fit in the broader regulatory system you know this is deeply tied with competition uh this is deeply tied with privacy and data protection these other regulators mm -hmm. there was a uk report it was a house of lords committee report it did not gain traction and it should have and it said and I mean, maybe I just love a good regulator. I don't know. But it said that what we need is this oversight body. It's not a regulator, but essentially a digital body that serves to be the connecting point to see the connections between these different regulators so that this area is dealt with more holistically so that everyone is more informed about what to do going forward. You raised a really interesting point at the end there that I want to return to. Um, Amira, do you want to jump in there though on the on this structure? Yeah, yeah no, sure. I mean, so yeah, I, I so first of all, I I think we need a regulator. I, I I actually think there's there's no doubt about that. And in fact, yesterday we were having one of our sort of discussions around uh, transparency, and it was clear that a regulator will be able to you know audit the and 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 make sure to report back to us you know how well or not. Um, they are doing when it comes to ensuring that their that their algorithms are working and letting us know how things are happening. Because at the moment, it's a bit of a black box, as as, as researchers would know in particular. And, and there's 
not a lot of uh, ability or capacity for, for instance, journalists to do this type mm. of research and continue to report to us, you know, what kind of, of harms are happening online. And I just wanted to add too that, uh, you know, um, back in June, the government had um, also announced that they were going to amend the Human Rights Act um, and the Able Community Human Rights Commission and the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal to intake, review, and adjudicate hate speech complaints and amend the criminal code to provide a definition of hatred for Section 319 hate propaganda mm -hmm. offenses and provide a new peace bond designed to prevent the commission of hate propaganda offenses and hate motivated crimes and reading from, from that. Um, and so I just wanna say that that is also something that has been requested by community or co many community organizations. It's, it's, mm. a, it's an echo of section 13 that had existed previously and certainly you know, a wide range um, of communities were impacted um, by hate, you know, obviously even for the onslaught of the online space um, and you know, asking for, for some kind of robustness and in the way that people can access justice is really necessary and one of the reasons why we're seeing i think this response and this remedy but again it comes back to the issue of how well resourced with any will any of this be um, will the canadian human rights commission you know have the adequate support it will require to ensure that individuals do have um, you know a quick uh, ability. Although there's also the on the flip side where um, some community organizations are worried about the onus being on victims having to push for um, remedies when in fact, you know, a regulator, for instance, could ensure that there are um, penalties handed out to these platforms if they do not take action quickly enough to mm -hmm. prevent um, any further Arms and to stop where, where it's happening. So again, this is such, it's such a deep discussion as, as many of you would know. Um, and certainly from community's perspective, um, it's one that we need to have more of. And frankly, uh, you know, the federal government will certainly need to be open for further reforms to what they're proposing currently, because it's, it's not where it needs to be. I think that's a, a point everybody agrees on, on here. Um, so I, I want to turn to some questions that have come in um, in the chat here. Um, so please keep sending them in. We have about 15 minutes um, to open it up a little bit. Um, and I, I guess just one building on, on your last point there, Amira, about um, what sort of legal mechanisms we have in place here to deal with things that are already illegal. Um, and in some ways those are gonna exist outside of a regulatory capacity that might actually be a legal capacity. And, and one thing um, often talked about is different um, forms of liability, either for amplification. There's a couple of questions we have here about liability for algorithmic amplification. And is that's not putting onus on individuals, but it is placing different onuses on corporations um, who distribute the speech of those individuals. Um, do we see other legal mechanisms we should be adding here, um, or is the regulator model sort of sufficient? I know Emily is our resident lawyer here. Do you want to jump in on that first? Yeah, I, okay. I'll just say that I'm actually really torn on this, so I'm curious what the other mm. panelists have to say. And let me say why I'm torn about this is... Um, I keep trying to remind myself that, uh, you know, maybe this just is a poorly named proposal of online harms and as though it is supposed to solve all these problems. And it's not. It is very mm -hmm. narrowly targeted to a particular speech. Um, and, and so what worries me is we need to address those issues. It might bog things down to address it here. But what I worry about is we proceed with this and whatever form it's going to take and we take that box and and then forget about some of those other issues like forget about the fact that algorithmic amplification is one of the sources of harm here. I don't have a good solution for you at the moment of that I don't think I think everyone's trying to work on that issue. Mm. Um, you know, how do we address the particular business model and how is that going to intersect with that legislation again that was something that's not particularly addressed in this legislation. Does it belong here? I don't know. Um, what complicates it uh, is the fact that we've created this regulator. So we're creating this entire system just to deal with these narrow issues. And so does that mean all these other points are gonna be left on the outside? Uh, the other example I give would be this entire civil law side of defamation and, and the tort of privacy invasions and forms of bullying 
they're not going to have any of the recourse that's available here. Yet that is also some of the everyday ways that people are profoundly harmed. And there are constitutional reasons why this is a difficult hurdle and can't really be done. Um, but I think for the public, it's actually going to be hard, you know, to, to understand that. And, and, um, and we need to think about that more broadly. Right, right. And can I push on that liability piece a little bit? I mean, if we're entering into a, a debate in the, the US, I think, around removing certain liability protections that platforms have had. Um, how is that debate playing out in, in Europe, in your view? So that debate has evolved over the past, I would say, 10 years. Uh, and there is, at its very core, especially for a country like Canada, who is now sort of getting into the online harms debate, um, you want to be very careful not to use uh, liability as the solve all for everything, assuming that if you remove liability, then you will fix the problem, whether it's making sure that illegal content is coming down or having you know, less harm on, amplified on the platform, because it just doesn't work. It just it just doesn't work because the company in itself is is primed to uh, avoid legal risk, and so what always is on the chopping block is free expression, uh, and so this is why I think over the course of many years and in, in Europe there was the e-commerce directive that was passed in you know ninety nine so very in in the very crib stages of the internet. It's just undeniable that it is not the same internet of today. And I think that's a similar discussion that's happening in the US, in India, and many, many parts of the world. It's just, you know, our current framework is completely inadequate to address, again, how content is, is, is curated and amplified and targeted towards specific people and what kind of real life impact that is having. And like, you don't even need to be on Facebook or on a particular social network to be subject to harm. I mean, we're talking like the highest levels of harms for, for liberal democracies, you know, unstable democracies, um, you know, elections, integrity of elections, people's lives are at stake frequently, genocide. I mean, the, the, the worst of the worst. So, so I think, yeah, so anyway, to come back to your, your very pointed question, <laughs> it's, it's not enough. And so that's why, um, <laughs> The liability can be a way to sort of push companies because again, if you know they may listen more closely, but it can't be the only thing. And that's why you need to have um, a systems or procedural based approach that encourages more behavior or more accountable behavior. So how are they optimizing certain kinds of content? Is it just for um, uh, eyeballs? Mm. If it's just for eyeballs, then you're, you, you, we all know what the outcome will most likely be. So maybe we need to have insight into how they're, con they're curating and ensure that they're also making sure that there's a qualitative measure in there, making sure that when there are certain borderline content or an election is coming up or a specific hate group is being targeted, that it's stopped in its tracks. And that's not gonna happen just if you remove liability. Can I yeah. just jump in oh, with... Yeah. Sure. One thing I wanted to say on that is, um, you know, Canada, though, is in a very odd situation at the moment where we're jumping in and creating this this sort of regulatory framework. But our intermediary liability laws are are woefully underdeveloped compared to other countries. So they're building these regulatory, you know, kind of um, models on the backs of at least a framework of intermediary liability. I mean, ours is just old fashioned common law of defamation. And that's really just about it. And so I think part of this process is we should think more clearly about the instances when an intermediary should be liable, and they should be sometimes. Um, and, um, and, you know, we, we're going to face some challenges with our trade obligations. Certainly, um, it seemed that uh, the U.S. Uh, broad immunity, broad safe harbor was, was, um, imported with the, the, with the new NAFTA, with USMCA. Mm -hmm. And so we might face some difficulties in, in, in the way that we craft some sort of intermediary liability framework, but whether we do something like a duty of care, whether it's some um, responsibility for reasonable decision-making, 
whether it's like more scaled in a different way, I think we need to set that that baseline for those instances to enable civil liability in, in the extreme instances when it's appropriate. What, what's your reading of USMCA? Do you think even regulatory approaches might bump up against that intermediary liability provision? Well, you know, I mean, that's certainly UN uh, had noted this, UN and, and Vivek Krishnamurthy, yeah. and, in, in their report that they actually highlighted, they, they think that the proposal as it stands is a real risk to violating, you know, Article 1917 of, mm. of the USMCA. Um, I think that where it is more difficult is that the US is also facing, you know, uh, a potential mm -hmm. kind of amendments to Section 230. So is there a real appetite to enforce it? Um, we haven't even implemented it here. So I, it's, it's unclear. Um, I think that um, there's potentially, if we create a regulatory regime, we're okay. When we move towards, if we start creating, say, a duty of care or some, you know, uh, liability obligation um, or liability risk, uh, that, then there's a greater risk under 1917. Thank you. Mira, do you want to jump in on this? I mean, look, I think that the the sort of catch 22 if I can use a few cliches or that we want to see the government move fast that means they might break things but we are also not wanting to, to break critical things like you know the freedom of expression as well as to again target marginalized communities that are already uh, feeling targeted right now and potentially uh, limit the way that people are organizing and talking about uh, you know key issues of the time and being labeled as you know promoting terrorist content when in fact they're talking about whether it's indigenous rights or black Black Lives Matter or any other type of movements. And so there really is this balancing act and this discussion around, you know, what is the right approach? I mean, the regulation, again, it just seems to be necessary. But what Emily said about the fact that we have already weak like legislation, other things, there's a, a lack of enforcement on existing uh, regulations and legislation, that certainly is, uh, you know, a big problem, because it winds up being why do we, why do we keep having to start from scratch? Why are we not strengthening what we have and examining how it all fits in together? Um, and so that's certainly, uh, you know, part of the issue. But I think what I would say is that we, we certainly see again that there has to be this starting place and if the government is truly committed to presenting uh, the solution to this complex issue um, and all of its multifaceted dimensions, that does mean that uh, we will listen to the voices of whether it's the legal researchers, whether it's communities that are uh, explaining how it impacts them and ensuring that that the whole of society approach is one that breaks the least amount, if not anything at all, but ensures that there is the protection that is woefully inadequate at the moment. So, mm -hmm. uh, so in a nutshell, I think we are moving in the right direction. Um, and a lot of this is very complex for the average person who's on social media, and many of us are on social media. We expect the government to be taking action to protect Square. That's the expectation of the vast majority of Canadians. How we get to it, well, that is where uh, the voices of the experts and the communities have to be playing into it and that we have to understand, you know, where are the biggest concerns and how, and the government has to be transparent in how it plans to address that. And that transparency is key uh, simply because, you know, even right now with COVID, we've seen the conspiracy theories. We've seen all of the, the anti-Semitic tropes that are out there. We've seen all of the various ways in which communities are being targeted, even in the midst of an, you know, an international global crisis that has, again, those real world consequences that are impacting on, on folks. And so, um, you know, the time is now, but again, uh, we, we definitely are, are cognizant of the potential harm in moving too quickly. Thank you. I mean, and, and the, full, the flip side of a lot of these calls for more transparency and more data from companies is obviously the data that's collected themselves. And, and there's a great question here around um, C11 and what degree actual privacy, data privacy reforms should be part of this toolkit here too, um, not just whether data should be shared with regulators and research, but whether it should be collected at all. Um, and, and maybe, and there's another question I'll tie that to, which is, as we're wrapping up here, to pull from international examples that you think should be brought into the Canadian 
Canadian context. Um, and I, I do wonder, Regan, first looking at the EU, whether um, some of that integration between privacy reform and online harms laws and even competition policy um, have been integrated a little more closely and in a slightly more sophisticated way than there, that's hap than this happening here. And is that something you would sort of urge for? Or does that cause more complications because you're doing a dozen things at once? <laughs> I think, it, I think considering privacy and data protection is just a crucial sort of table stakes element uh, dealing with all sorts of issues, but especially, you know, in, in this area when we're talking about systemic transparency, I think there's always a sort of asterisk caveat that's like within the limits of data protection of security. So when we ask, for instance, for full disclosure of advertisements and targeting criteria, you know, the content of the ads that platforms run, um, this should not in any way uh, in engender or expose individual accounts or, or even lead to sort of um, an identification of groups of people. And there are ways to do this. So um, in the EU, I think this has been less of a issue, I think mostly because the processes of the GDPR happened years ago. And so now, you know, the kind of big thing is online harms. And so, you know, everything has to be compliant with the GDPR. So that yeah. sort of does solve that. But I think that's a really good um, flag, especially in considering this, because for anyone that has been following uh, Mozilla and others who have been asking uh, Facebook in particular for more transparency on advertising uh, because Facebook has repeatedly blocked access to public interest researchers like Ad Observer, this uh, NYU project um, that has, uh, yeah, so that has been, that has been very uh, problematic. And a lot of the reasoning that Facebook continues to give is that it's because of privacy concerns. That's why they can't be transparent. So I guess generally I would um, warn against uh, this sort of pitting, often artificial pitting against mm. transparency and privacy, because the reality is we can have both and both are mutually reinforcing. It's the same with content regulation or accountability mm. and free expression. Mm. They are actually, we're not sacrificing freedom of expression to have more accountability or to remove hate uh, online or to reduce mm -hmm. harm. We are actually enhancing free expression by addressing the root cause causes of online harm. And so these are all like mutually reinforcing and not, not conflicting or they don't have to be conflicting. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, I wanna go to Amir and Emily um, now, but just to, we're bumping up against time here, so maybe just pose a final a final question for you, for you both, for you all, all three of you, which is uh, we the government's going to come back at the end of November. Um, it has said that this legislation um, is in its sort of hundred day agenda. Um, what do you think that they should do? Um, what should the process be? either specifically of how it should be changed or more generally um, how this should be um, uh, reformed given that the, the broad consensus here, and I would say more, more broadly in the community of, of civil society and, um, and interested actors here all seem to think there needs to be a reframing or a rejigging. Uh, who wants to go the first? Public <laughs> uh, the, the public yeah. consultation, I'll jump in, the public consultation only closed on Fifth, as someone pointed out in the chat. Yeah. So, you know, if if they are to be robust and, and uh, you know, legit, it means that the government needs to spend time, uh, you know, reviewing the, those consultations uh, and where possible making that available to, uh, to Canadians so that we can understand the scope and breadth of which people are concerned and have raised uh, the various types of concerns that uh, all of us have mentioned here. You know, I've based a lot of uh, what I've said today on uh, the submissions of various organizations that have indeed sent in uh, their analysis of the current proposals. Um, and so, you know, again, it's clear that this should be, you know, just one more step towards a final a piece of legislation and a final piece of regulatory framework that 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 comes to to fruition um and so it should not be rushed but at the same time there is i i heard this 
concerned that we don't want to have you know, paralysis by analysis either, because clearly the issue is one that's very pressing. So finding that fine balance in terms of ensuring that the, these very significant concerns I've heard about potential charter challenges against the current proposals based on the overreach uh, are potentially possible. We don't want that to happen. We do want them to get it right from the get go. Um, and so ensuring that though that feedback is taken into consideration um, and that there is that public uh, capacity for discussion and dialogue around what impacts all of us. So that's really what, what the government has to weigh in. And it's better to take a bit longer with it than again to rush and, and break too many things. Thank you. Emily? Um, I'm, maybe I'll leave it as uh, just one concrete recommendation because yes, I think that you know more consultation is 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 needed on this one to make it you know achieve its its objectives and be charter compliant. Um, but I actually think that in that consultation they should you know almost break it down by issue because I think what we're missing sometimes is is being able to have the deep dive discussion about the complexity of each, each issue. Like, let's have a deep dive consultation just about 24 hour content takedown. Let's have a deep dive about yes. proactive monitoring. Let's have then a separate discussion just focused on website blocking. And then we can start putting the puzzle together. But sometimes when it's these high level consultations and we're all kind of submitting it, trying to capture as much, much as we can without writing a book, um, that they never get the benefit of the level of detail that's needed for them to make a proper decision and weigh things to figure out what's right for Canada. So, so that would be what I would love to see is the consultation going forward. Mm. And to, to Michael Geis' comment in the chat, I see maybe actually see the consultations as well. Um, it would be great to see the input that everybody has um, yeah, thoughtfully added and the work that's been done to, to assist in this policy process. Um, Regan, last word is to you. How do you how do you guide the Canadian government from across the, from across the ocean? Well, I'm I'm very much in favor of doing away with the move fast and break things. I think for the internet, we've broken enough things, and now it's time to slow down and fix things. Um, and this is such a tricky topic. Um, so I actually agree with a lot of what uh, Emily has said about maybe splitting it up. The omnibus, omnibus type of approach is it can be really sort of problematic. I think a lot of good policy dies in omnibus bills, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with a regulator, with this, with six different time, kinds of illegal content. So I think I think what that means, yeah, is probably more re, like more, just more understanding and more um, evidence gathering needs to be done. I just, I think it really comes down to, does the Canadian government want to solve, like advance solutions to these very, very uh, big problems? Or do they want an easy political win? And that's the question. So if it's done in, in the first hundred days finished and there's like yeah. a more, you know, bigger blocking framework and content is coming down and the transparency reports that companies produce are saying lots of content is coming down. Um, is that really addressing the problem? Or does the Canadian government actually want to think about a paradigm and a framework where big companies will behave more accountable and there will be less harm uh, online? And so to really, it's about addressing the problem or not, in, in my view. So I hope I hope they address it. I think that's such a, a, a both, in, both correct framing, but also really positive one to end on, that there is a, there's an opportunity here to get this right. Um, and they're just, a tremendous amount of people who care deeply about this topic and think deeply about it, who, who want this to, to, to be right, <laughs> um, including the three of you. So thank you so much for, for speaking with me and, and with everybody on the call here. Um, Sam, um, you wanna jump back in? Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. That was, I thought, an excellent enlightening discussion and thanks to everyone for attending and the great contributions in the chat and uh, at Ryerson and Miguel, we're, you know, looking forward to continuing to convene and um, bring forward uh, new ideas in this space, because uh, um, I think this is, you know, one of the most pressing and complex challenges of our time. Uh, and I hope, you know, you've learned something and that you can carry that into your, your own networks and spaces as well. 
Uh, a recording of this uh, and a transcript is going to be posted in the coming days and shared with you by email uh, if you missed anything. Um, I'd also encourage you to check out uh, our next virtual event at the Cybersecurity Policy Exchange, which is in three weeks on November 5th, called Blurred Lines Workplace Surveillance Meets Remote Work on our new uh, report about uh, the challenge of emerging tech that tracks employees in their homes, um, which you can register for now. We just are throwing a link in the chat. Thanks again to our uh, panelists. That was awesome. And um, uh, thanks and have a great day.